Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today in these unusual times. Thank you to the Arkansas Bar, of course, for hosting this virtual alumni luncheon for us. And I'm so pleased that so many of you could join who might not have been with us in Hot Springs, um, thanks to the virtual world. So a warm welcome and thank you uh, from the law school community here in Fayetteville. What I wanted to do today was really to give you um, a recap of our spring, kind of the inside view on what, what happened at the law school, as well as an inside view of what we're planning at the law school in the fall. I'd like to talk with you about the class of 2020 that faces some challenges that no other class has ever had to face. Um, I'd like to highlight some really important things happening at the law school, both with our public service fellows, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm really excited today that we have Sean Johnson with us uh, from the Law Alumni Society to share their awards uh, with some terrific alumni, though I think you're all terrific and I'm glad you're part of our community. So let's start with recapping the spring. Dean McCabe, if you don't mind, there you go. Oh, they are sorry. Um, I am. I also want the group to know as technology goes, I cannot see my slides as they advance. Uh, my screen is black, um, which is unusual for Zoom. Usually it's quite reliable for me, but that's okay. Um, that's what we do in law, right? We pivot and we figure it out. So um, we're uh, hopefully on the spring 2020 recap uh, slide. What I wanted you to know um, is just to set the stage a little bit about what it's been like for your law school. Uh, I was in a meeting the week before March 16th and Chancellor Steinmetz had called all of the academic leaders together to say, uh, in the past, we've often thought we might need to deal with pandemics and prepare for them, H1N1 and some other things, but this time it's real. So get your, get your faculty ready to go remote and not return from spring break. So I went back to the law school and we have a terrific team there, people like Randy Thompson and Will Foster and Susanna Polvoet. And I said, this is coming, this is real. Our faculty, amazing people got into our faculty meeting room, heard from Randy about what our tech options were and that our plan was to go remote uh, right after spring break. Fast forward 72 hours and the order comes that we need to go remote now. And so um, I'm just incredibly proud of our faculty and staff who quite literally in 72 hours, like many of you did in your practice and professional lives, pivoted to this new virtual world. Um, of course, we had many concerns about our students, uh, not only obviously their health and well-being, but their access to technology, the quality of their learning. And so we, we were incredibly fortunate to have a lot of good communication uh, between faculty and faculty and students and students and students and felt like we did um, a good job of keeping our community intact. Um, probably one of the biggest issues, not only in Fayetteville, but nationally uh, in higher ed law schools as well has been the grading policy. And I wanted our alumni to know, of course, that we amended our grade policy to pass fail in recognition of the inequities that existed between our students, some of them at home with young children and weak technology, others uh, alone in apartments with great Wi-Fi, but not a lot of uh, social contact to keep them engaged. So we tried to level the playing field in that way. Um, and that was one of the biggest issues, surprisingly for me as a dean, was the amount of um, frankly, just angst that went into our grading policy and all the things that it influences. And I, I also have to say that it brought together deans nationally because so many schools were dealing with the same issues and the same concerns. Um, but we got through that and we got through that with a pass fail system. And again, some really dynamic faculty who figured out how to give exams that really tested where students were in terms of learning outcomes. During this time too, our student services continued. Um, it's an amazing feat, but our advising team, which usually consists of a, a staff person in our student services team and a faculty member, was able to meet with all of, um, with all of their faculty 
Um, I mean, with all of their advisees and give them uh, coaching for course selection, as well as some extra support around how to manage the pandemic. Career Services, Terry Chaddock, also leading the charge there to make sure that students knew how to reach out uh, to offices that were also going remote quickly, uh, weren't sure what the future of work was going to be for them, um, and Terry there meeting one-on-one, -on -one, while at the same time implementing a new service that many of you will hear about if you're employers in Arkansas and beyond called 1220. It's a much more powerful platform to connect employers with students and students with opportunities. So I'm very excited that even in the middle of a pandemic, we were able to make some tech changes that will benefit not only our students, but employers. And finally, our academic support team. Can you imagine, you know, students who really uh, benefit from one-on-one -on -one coaching or really enjoy their office hours and their interaction with peers and professors don't necessarily have that anymore. Um, our academic support team in place to reach out to students who seem to be struggling or who may have fallen off the radar to make sure that they were okay. Um, and I share this with you because I hope it, it, it really evokes for you your experience in Fayetteville. It's an incredibly student-centric environment. And um, I think we, we carried that through the pandemic. We also ran town halls with regularity with our students to update them on everything from how to access uh, tech resources to what the law review process will look like um, to write on in fall of 20. And, and so it was a great way for us to get feedback directly from students and we'll continue those through the summer. So let me, let me move now to what does the fall semester look like? Um, you may have heard in Arkansas that um, we have a return to campus plan and a university system commitment to face-to-face -to -face learning to the extent possible. So in Fayetteville, we have phases. June, we will have uh, our faculty, not at the law school, but across campus who are running labs, um, able to return to their labs. July brings back a few more personnel to help us get ready for the fall. And August is when we really return to work again, to the extent possible. We want to do this safely. And all of this plan, our return to campus plan is subject to ADH and CDC guidance. So um, some adjustments in the university approach, we will not have a fall break this year. Obviously not a great idea to send all of our people off campus to travel and have them all come back possibly from areas that have positive cases and uh, cause a spike of, uh, of COVID-19. And then at Thanksgiving, all of our operations will pivot to remote for student learning and for student services, the same concept as fall break. We don't want to send people home and then have them return exposed to a number of different germs, including flu by that time, and possibly not only have an outbreak on campus, but bring those germs back to their families. So what does that really look like at the law school? It means we're preparing at the same time for plan A and plan B. Plan A, we will, uh, we have prioritized our 1L class. Uh, we have figured out how they will have a uh, normal-ish fall semester, I would say, by face-to-face um, -face courses, primarily in the courtroom, socially distant, um, and with academic support and other things available to them remotely. Our upper level classes will have a mix of remote options and in-person options. Um, but this all happens across the backdrop of plan B, which is to be remote at any time. If we've learned nothing since February, it's that COVID-19 is unpredictable and that we need to be ready at any time to take to make the steps to keep our community safe and as healthy as possible. So throughout all of this, everybody is preparing always to be ready to go remote. We obviously have a lot more experience with that after three or four months. And as Dean, my big belief for the fall is that if we focus on our core values um, and we're prepared for any learning environment, 
we will do right by our students and our faculty will continue to do what they do best, which is educate the next generation of lawyers. So while it is tempting to maybe go down, uh, you know, the, the path of what about this and what about that and this technological piece, right now in June, what we're really trying to do is focus on our core values. How do we teach well in any setting? How do we deliver student services well in any setting? And once we identify those core values, a lot of July is going to be spent with implementing plans and making plans for the fall. And August is just our run up uh, to a fall semester open. So that's what the fall semester would look will look like. Um, I'd like to next talk about something that comes from the pandemic, which is important to was important to uh, our success if only so students felt some sense of safety. Many schools, um, ours included, established a law student emergency fund in the spring. And I, so I really want to acknowledge a national organization that supports law student financial literacy called Access Lex. Access Lex um, has their, their resources typically come from student loans and revenue, and they are very responsible in partnering with legal education to ensure our students have a sound future. Access Lex gave $25,000 to each school that uh, was able to establish an emergency fund. And a shout out to Tori Gaddy, who uh, was all in from the minute I said, can we do this? And it's one of the most quickly established funds at the university um, in my experience. And so I wanted to acknowledge Access, Access Lex's role in that, but also the generous donors, many of you out there on the, on the call who, who provided support. Um, this is a really important part of what we can do for our students could be something which for many may seem simple. Their laptop broke. They have no funds to be able to replace it with something that's suitable for remote learning. We can help them. Or they are unexpectedly ill and they have medical bills that were unanticipated and if they aren't able to pay them, they're really serious consequences for them. It's such a gift from this community to be able to say to a student who's really stressed, let us lift some of the burden for you. So thank you to all of you who have supported the Law Student Emergency Fund. And if you, um, if you are interested in doing that and haven't in the past and didn't even know about the fund, you can find the information about it right on the front page of our website. So that made us feel good um, to be able to help students in a, in a unique way. I also want to say this. Uh, we all know that legal education is in transition. Um, it probably has been since the Great Recession, as have been many of your practices, changes uh, coming uh, due to technology, due to different kinds of legal issues, different um, support for different kinds of work. And so as we transition, um, I want to let you know that the American Bar Association section on legal education and the council have really been remarkably supportive of law schools across the country. Our listserv um, amongst deans nationally is very active with schools trying to figure out how we can best work together to support student success and to support the profession. So the ABA has been providing a lot of guidance to us. Um, as many of you know, they are the U.S. Department of Education's accreditor of law schools for the purposes of federal programs like financial aid. So their guidance and compliance with it has real consequences for students who need to access financial aid. We have had added to our administrative load a spring summer 2020 questionnaire, which is a terrific exercise in kind of what did you do in the spring? How did you meet student needs? Who went online? How did that happen? And that rolls into a fall 2020 certification where, as I said earlier, we will have remote learning continue. And it may be the tool that we must use depending on the behavior of COVID-19. So we do have regulatory flexibility from the ABA to exceed their standards in distance education. 
And what I think that this has really triggered is that distance education has um, not been widely embraced in legal education. I don't know if it will be, but it certainly gives us new opportunities to think about how we might deliver legal education more effectively. I think that's really important in a state like Arkansas, where there are a lot of financial hurdles to overcome to move to Fayetteville for three years, just as anybody who's going to a residential law school faces. Um, and so we will be thinking carefully about distance education. Um, and now that all faculty across the country have had uh, experience with it, I think we'll see some really good ideas about how to teach our students uh, better and more effectively, um, both in the classroom setting and online. Of course, this also might bring new competition um, across the landscape. And so we're all waiting, I think, in legal education to see what what the trends are and what's coming but i wanted this group to know that we're really watching that from fayetteville and we want to do what's best for uh, not only our students but for the state in terms of providing legal education so in fayetteville as i said earlier just like uh, we've been doing in the spring and in the summer our focus will always be on teaching our students and supporting them on their individual paths into the profession wherever that happens whatever that looks like um, so I think we, we look forward uh, to learning and growing in legal education, but most of all, we look forward to making sure that our students are learning well and ready to enter the profession. I'm going to move on now to the class of 2020. Uh, for those of you who were around after uh, or in the profession during the Great Recession, you know how hard some of the classes that graduated during that period were hit with declines in employment. And some of them actually never entered the profession. And it's something that I think makes many of us sad who were uh, working at law schools at the time to see really talented students uh, not be able to enter the profession because the opportunities were not there for them. So the benefit of that experience is bringing into our thinking what's happening with the class of 2020, which may forever be known as the pandemic class. You know they missed their graduation and commencement opportunity, and that was a, a difficult thing. We did offer um, a fun, not commencement, but more of a toast to our class of 2020 to congratulate them in a much more informal way. The university anticipates that all spring graduates of 2020 will be invited to attend the December winter graduation and will continue to monitor whether we can uh, convene our students who choose to attend that in, into some sort of celebration. But in reality, I'm not really sure it's realistic to think about large gatherings even in December of 2020. Um, we're going to continue to ask about the employment challenges or lack of challenges. I've had interesting conversations with some of you who may be out there today and others who aren't who are in practice and some have said yes we are really busy um, and we're also really productive and others who have said no our practice has really slowed down and we're, we're rethinking our plans um, and we're, we're looking at strategies for getting through this patch. So um, We'll continue to think about how we keep track of the class of 2020. Um, in just a minute, I'll show you a, a slide about what they're facing with respect to the bar exam. But my questions are, how do we support this class, not only from the Fayetteville campus and our faculty and staff, but as, a, as an alumni group, how do we make sure that they stay engaged and can feel supported in facing the challenges that the pandemic has thrown at them. If you can all think back to your 3L year and the elation that came in May, along with a little bit of maybe trepidation about studying for the bar, and imagine that happening at a time where you don't have graduation, you're not even sure if you can sit for a bar exam at that point in May, and you don't have the camaraderie of your friends um, as you celebrate your accomplishments over the last three years, um, it's a tough thing. Um, I'm proud of, uh, again, our development office and doing a lot of support and gathering your inspirational 
thoughts for them, those are also on our website. And if you haven't contributed uh, kind of kind and motivating words, again, our website allows you to do that. And then of course, we're wondering how are their professional lives altered? What are the positives? Maybe they have more employment opportunities because there are more remote opportunities for them. Um, also, though, we know there may be some negatives. Um, and so we always appreciate hearing from our alumni uh, about what's happening in your practice area. What are your needs? What are the future trends you're seeing um, for your firm or for your government agency? Because that really helps us educate students, even our graduates, about how to best position themselves to enter the profession. So our next slide is, um, you know, just an example of what a terrific team at the, the law school came up with doing. We knew we couldn't gather, so we tried to do a collection of little things. Like I said, we had a fun Zoom toast for them, and we also had a banner at Arkansas and Dixon um, showing congratulations to UARC Law 20 and encouraged our students on social media to have their pictures taken beneath the banner. Um, and I'm sure for many of them that was not how they expected to be wearing their regalia on the street corner there, but um, I know they appreciated that we were thinking of creative ways uh, to support them. And uh, the Law Alumni Society also provided financial support for them to have a, just a nice coffee mug, one of the first that says Arkansas Law with a razor back, so we're excited about that. Um, but here's the next slide that shows you a little bit about the challenges that um, face this class. This is the NCBE map of the country. Uh, you will see on it seven bar exam dates, and you will see an additional six variations on those dates and what will be happening. We're very fortunate here in Arkansas that our, our bar exam office has worked tremendously hard to keep the bar exam on track um, and we currently hope that that will continue uh, to be the case and it all again depends on the pandemic and what is safe but if you look across the country you can see that in texas now there are two dates in texas um, and there are also suspension of some of their rules for practice um, and in some other states, uh, DC yesterday caused some controversy by changing itself and one of its, its exam dates uh, from a, uh, a uniform bar exam seating to a remote exam that is not UBE, but is jurisdiction specific. So if students aren't sitting in Arkansas, they are really having to look at, is the state that I'm sitting in going to have a seat? for me, if they have a seat for me or their quarantine rules that apply to me that require me to travel to that jurisdiction and self isolate for a certain number of days before I'm able to go to the exam, all the things that I'm pretty sure none of us thought about. Um, but again, I want to give a shout out to some of our national organizations like now, like NCBE and like LSAC, who have really, really been great communicators with the law schools to make sure that our students who are ready to enter practice um, have as much information as they can to control as much of the conditions that they can in the run up to their bar exam. So please be thinking about the class of 2020. If you're a firm that is in a position to offer employment, please make sure that um, you're in touch with Terry Chaddock at our uh, Career Services Office um, because there's some terrific people who have graduated who I'm pretty sure um, you would like to hire and are talented, but uh, the, the times make it a little confusing about how they would connect with those opportunities. So that's the class of 2020. I'd like to highlight two, two final things about the law school. The next is uh, we are so pleased that this year we were able to have uh, a second cohort of summer public service fellows. Um, you see there, there are nine wonderful faces there. These are students who entered the profession uh, for, by their own accounts to help, to make a difference. 
and what you can see is the number of places they're working, everything from the US SEC through to being our first Delta Fellow. Um, this is a, a student who is working with the Harvard Mississippi Delta Project, but on the Arkansas side this summer to begin thinking about how we can provide more legal services and support to that region of our state. It's a terrific program that allows these students to work um, in exchange for a fellowship where they might otherwise need to take on paid employment. And so it's a really a win, win, win. It's a win for these students to get the experience. It's a win for the placements who have the labor and, and the really enthusiastic students who want to uh, work in the public service sector. And then of course, it's a win for us as a law school because not only are we able to offer this program to students, but we also welcome them back at their end of the summer with having rich experiences that they really want to share uh, with, their, with their colleagues, with their professors, and um, also talk about the importance of public service and what they've learned. The last topic I'd like to talk about is diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's on all of our minds. The racial crisis, the exposure of injustice in our legal system is profound. And I know that we're all thinking about our commitment as lawyers and our special knowledge as lawyers about how can we improve our society and make our justice system equitable, more equitable, so that's top of mind, I think, for many, uh, me included. And I did want to give the alumni an update on what we've been doing well before this summer's crisis, because this issue is important to us and has been for some time. We were lucky to be supported by a university-wide initiative to really be thinking about the inclusiveness of our campus. So last year, we actually had a group of Excuse my pearl, just a moment. I am so sorry, the hazards of Zoom. I was talking about the action steps that we have um, in place at the law school. For the last year, with the guidance of the university's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, uh, a committee of faculty, students, and staff have been working on a plan that really talks about what are the action steps that we can take at the law school that support all students and all staff and all faculty in feeling valued and welcome. And so that plan has been made, but of course plans need to be implemented and action needs to be taken. So our first step is that we will be hiring a diversity director for the law school to work on helping us implement that plan, but also support our student organizations in, in offering programming at, that is of interest and also expands our thinking and our horizons. And of course, we'll be convening people and listening. Um, again, before the events of the last month unfolded, our orientation this year included a movie night. It's remote, it's a movie night. Um, watching Just Mercy and then convening in small groups to really talk about what does that movie reflect about so many things. But most of all, our justice system and what that story tells about the realities of our justice system. So for this group, I really wanted to say to you, please reach out to each other and to the law school to share your experiences around uh, race and our profession, around justice, around the rule of law. And I, I am always available to hear your thoughts and your ideas about how as a law school, we can become more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Um, so with that overview, I wanna take time, if we have time, I'd love to have questions. Please use the Q&A feature if you can. Um, I know some of you may not be accessing it in that way, um, but we are really, I would love to have your questions.
I see one here from David Bowling. Shout out to David. Hope all is well with you in DC. Our sense of the firms that interviewed at the law school is that almost everybody figured out a way to uh, actually have clerkships go forward. We were also really concerned about our public service fellows not being able to have placements. And again, um, you know, in one of the bright spots of, of the spring, everybody figured out how to make fellowships happen and clerkships. We may have a few who had things fall through. We may have a few who are still looking for things too. So if your firm has a need, um, please let Terry Chaddock know. We may be able to connect you with some talented students who are still looking for work this summer. Here's a great question about what legal clinics exist at the law school. Uh, we have several. We have Professor Tim Tarvin offering a bankruptcy clinic as well as a business formation uh, work for nonprofits, so 501c3 formation. Beth Zilberman offers an immigration law clinic. Annie Smith has two clinics. One is, they're both civil. One focuses on wage uh, cases and the other focuses on human trafficking. And of course we have Tiffany Murphy uh, who offers our criminal defense clinic. Um, and those are our principal clinics. Um, we do try to connect students through experiential um, externships to many other settings and we also have a robust pro bono program that also gives students another avenue to experience experiential learning. Okay, any other questions out there? Dean McCabe, if you don't mind, I um, would certainly like to moderate for you because you have three questions that have come in and you may not be able to see them. Okay, so great. With your Go permission, ahead. Um, is it yep. okay if I ask them for you? Super. Yes. Okay, great. What steps are being taken to reach out to the undergraduate students throughout Arkansas to consider U of A for law education? This is a great question. We've taken a couple of steps. As many of you know, Dean Jim Miller is near and dear to everyone's heart. And Jim is doing what he's always done, which is reaching out to pre-law advisors across the state at all schools to share the opportunity uh, that exists in Fayetteville. We also have Spencer Bowling and Tracy Defabaugh in our admissions office who have been doing more visits to schools uh, such as Pine Bluff and Fort Smith and uh, Arkansas State. So we're doing a fairly traditional boots on the ground outreach. But the second thing that we've um, been doing this spring is we've added digital outreach as well. And that can be, we've always been doing emails um, to students across the state who express an interest in law school. Um, but what we've added is a digital media strategy. We have a new blog called UARC Law Insights, which is found on our webpage. And we have lots of people like Professor Brill just wrote a really great advice for incoming 1Ls. Uh, there's other uh, blog posts there about, you know, why attend law school and things like that. And we take that content and we promote it on social media so that students in Arkansas who are using Facebook or LinkedIn or searching for information about law schools will become more aware of us. Our next wave is really to work again with alumni at, to help expand that network and do individual outreach to students once we recognize where they are. Um, one final point, we're always open to your suggestions about how we can engage people earlier in the, in the merits of law school. All of us know we need to have a broader pipeline. So if you have ideas about that, please let us know. Thank you, Dean McCabe. We also have a question from Regina Hopper. She uh, thanks you for your leadership of your, of the, of your great school. Um, what are the plans for students who are coming to the school this fall for those students who might end up becoming ill while at school? Such a great question, Regina. It's great to know you're out there. Um, thanks for joining us today. And I'm sure all of you have, have this question for your offices as well. So a couple of things about our fall students. First of all, any student who feels that they can't be safe on campus uh, because they're at risk or they live at people with people who have a high risk for COVID-19, uh, infection, 
have the option to participate remotely in classes. And that can either be a distance education course or they can be uh, synchronously participating in the course. For those students who fall ill during the year, that's the primary plan, meaning that we hope they are not so ill that they can't participate in class. Maybe that's a class or two like it is, you know, in any school year where we might have a student get the flu, but we recognize that they may be out for longer. And those students, again, will have digital access to their, their full course schedule. In terms of makeup, of course, there are individual plans that we'll need to make for students and also to recognize when a student, hopefully this doesn't happen, but we're thinking about it, what about the student that becomes gravely ill and has to take uh, more than a few weeks out of school? And those students will get what they always do in Fayetteville, which is a very individualized, supportive approach. Thank you. And we have a question from President Brian Rosenthal. Can you sponsor a portion of a fellowship joined with others to support? Brian Rosenthal, you're the best. <laughs> yes, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, our public service fellows are funded primarily through the generosity of donors. And so the cost is $5,500 to place a student for summer one and summer two into um, that placement. And if you wanted to get together with a group of friends or a group of firms, um, you could certainly do that. And we would welcome that. You can also do what some of our donors do, which is, for example, the Delta Fellow. That's a funder that says, I have a real interest in funding somebody who will work and commit to building legal capacity in the Delta. And, and we were able to match the student with that opportunity. Um, so Tori Gaddy or me, please reach out to either one of us. My dream for this school is to have as many fellowships as we have applications. And each year we see students more and more interested in answering the question, how can I give back in their first summer uh, after their first year. Um, so the answer is yes, you can, you can band together and support one or uh, more than one fellow. It's a wonderful way to help people experience public service and make a difference um, in the organizations that sponsor those students in the summer through employment. And the last question that I'm showing Dean McCabe is from Honorable Mark Lindsay. Will fall externships take place this year? Judge Lindsay, it's great to have a question from you. Yes, they will. Uh, many of you know Professor Angie Doss, who uh, works tirelessly, not only for students, but for field placements. Um, they will go forward. Um, each, each placement is frankly somewhat unique. Some are comfortable with assigning remote work. Others have particular social distancing or facial covering requirements that they're communicating with students. But yes, they will go forward. And if you have any particular questions about how to arrange that, if you, haven't, uh, if you have somebody coming this fall and you're not sure, please reach out to Professor Doss. Those are all the questions I'm showing, Dean. Thank you. Terrific. Well, I, again, will end with a thank you, just a, a big thank you to all of you for your support of your law school, uh, for its supporting its students and its programs. We are so lucky to have you. And an example of that good luck is our Law Alumni Society led by Sean Johnson. Um, I just want to give a big shout out to Sean and the incredible work he's put in in the last year to help the Law Alumni Society really take shape. And I'm very excited to hear Sean uh, award the first Law Alumni Society Award. So I'd welcome Sean to the screen at this point. Well, thank you very much, Dean. It's my honor to be here today and representing all of our alumni across the world doing amazing things. And we want to salute you uh, for your commitment to the law school and what you're doing and the long line of distinguished deans that you fall into. And we're so grateful to you and to all the faculty and staff who have worked so hard, as we know, uh, amidst this pandemic uh, and functioning in a way that we've just never been able to witness. And we're very grateful 
uh, for everything that, that is occurring at the law school. Uh, so you. I'll go ahead and transition in the program for just a moment and tell everyone hello and welcome. We will finish on time here in about 10 to 12, maybe 15 minutes. So I hope that that works for everyone's schedule. Uh, we in the Law Alumni Society, which is actually comprised of everyone on this call who is a, a graduate of the University of Arkansas School of Law, uh, it's, it includes everyone. And we encourage, of course, everyone to pay their dues, to be a member of the Alumni Association generally uh, for the University of Arkansas. But the Law Alumni Society is something very special to all of us. And this board, uh, which has many uh, friends of all of you on it, is a way for us to maintain connection to the many alumni who have walked those halls uh, in Fayetteville. And we're very uh, glad to be a part of it. And this year, what we have decided to do is restructure ourselves just a little into a committee structure uh, to make sure that we are honoring the individuals who have worked so hard to, um, to distinguish the law school in their professions, uh, in their public service, or in their role of promoting uh, careers and things like that. So we divide it into two committees. We have a committee of a whole, of course, but then we also have our awards committee, which is, has done the work that we are going to talk about here, as well as our nominating committee. And that nominating committee is the group that uh, helps us see who ought to be a member of the board in the future. And to that end, I would suggest to anyone on this call, if you're interested in serving on the Law Alumni Society board, it's a very rewarding opportunity. Please do email the law school, Tori Gaddy or Aaron Feller, who are both on this call, and let them know that you're interested because we would love to have you. Uh, so let's begin our award presentation with the first award, and it is listed there, as you see on the screen, it's the Career Champion Award. And as you can see, it's awarded to a firm or organization that has provided significant and consistent contributions toward the advancement of career services and student programming in one or more of the ways that are listed there. You know, participating in career programming, and posting about jobs or internships, uh, participating in those on-campus interviews and attending networking events and things of those sort. We as a committee looked very, uh, we had a lot of great nominees here and we, we reviewed it very carefully. And uh, we were very impressed as you can see with the next slide by the recipient of the award for this year, the first annual Career Champion Award to the legal team at Walmart. And we wanna congratulate you and thank you for your commitment to the law school and continually providing support for our students and faculty. I know that we have invited uh, Mr. Steve DeMara, if he's available on the line, we'd like for him to be able to uh, deliver a couple of words, or actually it's Ms. Holly Lahr. Holly, if you would, please unmute yourself and there you are. Take the stage. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd first like to share that Karen Roberts, our Executive Vice President and General Counsel, sends her regrets for not being able to make the meeting today, um, but also her thanks and appreciation for this reward. The legal department really enjoys and values its partnership with the law school, including the participation in the externship programs, the SPARC program, as well as providing speakers for the corporate council colloquium and other events. For me personally, the U of A, especially the law school, holds a special place in my heart, so I truly value the opportunities Walmart gives us to give back. So on behalf of the Walmart Legal Department, I'd just like to thank the law school and the Law Alumni Society for this award and honor today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holly. And we just can't say enough of a thank you, not only to Walmart, but all of our firms all across the state who are continuing to provide support for our alumni, uh, for helping us network and understand what it is that we can all contribute in order to make sure that the law school is always supported and that our legal profession is supported. It's that experience that matters and the clerkship programs and the career opportunities are so vital to us. So thank you very much. The next award, and there were a total of three awards that the uh, Law Alumni Society has created. The next two awards include the career champion, I'm sorry, the commitment to justice for early career, which is given to an alumnus or alumna who has been a, grad, a graduate for fewer than 10 years, as well as 
the Commitment to Justice Award for an alumna or alumnus who has been a graduate for longer than 10 years. But we'll begin with the, with the first one, which is the Commitment to Justice Award for the early career. This, as you can see there, is given to a former student, a graduate, an alumnus or alumna who has demonstrated a commitment to early justice, uh, and I'm sorry, who, who graduated within the last 10 years and who through personal achievement and service to the law school, their community, and the legal profession have brought honor and distinction both to themselves and the school of law. I wanna introduce you to Mr. Nathan Bogart, who is the recipient of this award designated by the Law Alumni Society. And we, we know of Nathan the following, and we'll give him an opportunity here in just a moment. He is a founding member of the law firm of Bogart, Small, and Naylor. He leads the firm's removal defense and litigation practice. He takes on pro bono cases or low pro bono cases, particularly for cases involving violence against women, U visa victims of, for victims of crime, and those in deportation proceedings. He is a co-host of Preguntas con el Abogado, Questions for the Lawyer, uh, an immigration law-related program airing in Northwest Arkansas on 97.95.7 FM, and he has also provided commentary on immigration law to various local media outlets in Arkansas, Missouri, and Texas. Nathan, we, we award you this award. We're grateful for your commitment to the Law Alumni Society. And if you're able to open up your, your microphone and your video, then please speak to us for a moment. Sure. Uh, no, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really humbled and, uh, and grateful uh, for the opportunity to uh, receive this recognition. I'm, I'm grateful to the law school and the Law Alumni Society for uh, considering the, the work that, uh, that we do uh, at our firm. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard work, but uh, rewarding work. And I'm um, just grateful to the people who put uh, their trust in us uh, during what is an exceedingly difficult uh, time uh, in, in proceedings that uh, are certainly not uh, tailored to their favor. So thank you. We thank you, Nathan, and we look forward to many more years of, of service to the alumni network that we have, to the university and to the legal profession. And uh, we're grateful for your experience and your contribution. So congratulations. The final award today, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, is the Commitment to Justice Award for uh, an alumna or alumnus who has been a graduate for longer than 10 years. And as you see there, it's, it's, it's given to someone who has demonstrated through their personal commitment and service to the law school, their community and a legal profession, and, and brought honor and distinction to both themselves and the school of law. It's intentionally a broad uh, description, uh, but we were very, uh, glad and pleased to see a large number of individuals who were nominated for this award. And this one particular recipient who has been chosen is somebody who I knew when I was in law school. Uh, it's, it's our friend, Judge Alex Gwynn. Uh, Judge Gwynn is a graduate of the class of 2005 from the law school. Uh, he has served in the past as the managing partner for a firm entitled Neely and Gwynn practicing in diverse specialties of law, including criminal defense, civil litigation and torts, corporate law, bankruptcy, domestic relations and family law, personal injury and sports law. Additionally, uh, he now serves as circuit judge for the 11th Judicial Circuit in Pine Bluff. He is a former assistant city attorney, public defender, dependency and neglect attorney ad litem and child advocacy and was employed by Walmart corporate legal department and the legal support operations manager for a sports management firm. He served as an adjunct professor of political science at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And in 2014, Judge Gwynn was, was appointed by a panel of circuit judges to the Federal Criminal Justice Act panel. And in 2015, to represent indigent federal court defendants and to the Jefferson and Legal County, ex excuse me, Lincoln County, Arkansas Public Defense Commission serve as a conflicts attorney. And Finally, I'll point out he was recognized by the Court Appointed Special Advocates, or CASA, for outstanding legal service as a Jefferson County attorney ad litem in 2014, in commendation by the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff's Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences for an in-depth lecture on criminal justice and juvenile delinquency. 
Uh, Judge Gwynn, that's a mouthful, and you've got a lot that you've already accomplished, and we're so grateful to be able to present this award to you. If you're available, please uh, open up your video and speak with us. All right. Can you see me? Okay. All right. Um, it's always good to be recognized publicly, but my mother told me when I was young, what you do in private matters the most. And then 20 years ago, Dean Miller and a number of staff uh, uh, let me into law school there. Uh, little did they know that nobody else want me. <laughs> they were the only law school to accept me. So, But since that time, I've been uh, trying to prove that I was worthy to be, to be admitted into law school. Uh, I've worked hard uh, in my career to show that, that I'm worthy of it. And more importantly, I thank Dean Miller and the rest of law school for being uh, seeing something in me that I didn't see in myself at that time. Uh, Dean Miller, uh, the late Professor Atkinson, uh, I Thank them for believing in diversity before it became a social uh, movement. Uh, they admitted a lot of black and brown faces in law school that created dialogue with school that made me more comfortable, a lot of others more comfortable, and better yet, it made our legal community as a whole better because of our experience at law school. Uh, when I, was, I had a chance to work at Walmart, and a guy by the name of Mike Bennett, he was a vice president there, he mentored me. Uh, judge Jones, he mentored me here in Pine Bluff, and now I'm, I'm the judge in his, his courtroom. So I say that to say this, that being committed to justice is all about helping others. And I believe that if we're committed to our craft, we have to find someone who doesn't look like us, who doesn't have the same background as us, and reach out to them and help them to better our legal community. We have to be the change that we want. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Gwynn. Uh, your hum humility and strength of character are the things that inspire the rest of us. Uh, we appreciate that. They are hallmarks of the University of Arkansas School of Law, as we have seen uh, year after year. And we will continue to fight for those principles and appreciate your, your, your commentary. That's so important to us. I want to congratulate all of the award recipients and all of those who were nominated, who will remain part of that nomination pool, of course, and we'll consider them uh, as time proceeds in the future. I also want to extend a word of thanks to our Law Alumni Society board. You know, I mentioned a few moments ago uh, that we are a board who, who meets in approximately three times a year, and it's a, a very enjoyable group to, to speak with and network with and to do this work with. Uh, if you are interested in any way in joining this cast, please let us know. Uh, you see our list there. I particularly want to highlight uh, five particular individuals who will be rolling off the board. They are, the color scheme there is red for those who remain, and it's dark and it's either blue or black for uh, those who will be rolling off. Uh, Vice President Rachel Urich, uh, Secretary Chuck Culver, uh, Buddy Chaddock from the Bassett Firm, uh, Tim Hutchinson, and David Matthews from the David Matthews uh, Rhodes McClure. Uh, they have several names up there in Rogers. Uh, David, if you're on, and, and Buddy, uh, Tim, Rachel, Chuck, we want to thank you so much for your service to the Law Alumni Society, for your service to the law school, and we look forward to continuing to working with you in the future. Uh, th this is a, like I said, it's a wonderful group. It's been very enjoyable to be a part of, and uh, if anyone would like to join us, we'd be glad to. Uh, this is a group that takes pride in the faculty who have, many of whom are on this call, as well as people like Dean Miller, who we've, we've all known for years and years. He's come up on this call many times, and Professor Brill. Uh, we are so grateful to all of you for your continuing service to the law school, and uh, we appreciate this opportunity to be with you today. Uh, unless there are any additional comments or, con or, or questions, I, I want to thank the Dean and Aaron Feller and Tori Gaddy for organizing this luncheon. Uh, let's continue on in this age of COVID and let's make it all worthwhile and show everybody how it's done. Uh, we can do it. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good day.